Rabat. In addition to Meknes, Fes and Marrakesh, Morocco's capital city of Rabat is one of the country's historic four royal cities. Despite their differences, these cities share a common bond. They each contain the cultural and architectural treasures of a fascinating epoch. A number of the city's past ambitious building projects failed to materialize. And today, only the ruins survive of a gigantic mosque that was never fully completed. Measuring 183 by 139 meters, this was one of the most ambitious building projects in the Islamic world. Following the death of the Almohadi leader Yaqub El Mansur in 1199, construction of the mosque came to an end. The neighboring mausoleum is of earlier origin. Modern influences aside, the magnificent royal burial place of Muhammad V and Hassan VI reflects the architectural traditions of a bygone age. The city of Rabat has a rich and colorful history. It was first settled in the 8th century BC nearly 2,000 years before the Hassan Tower was built. Today, there are few traces of the Romans and Phoenicians who originally settled here. The city owes its present name to the Sanhaja Berbers who built a fortress here, a so-called Ribat in the 10th century. Yaqub El Mansur gradually enlarged the fortress until a city eventually developed from the original fortifications. By the end of the 12th century, Rabat was at its zenith. Massive six kilometer long walls and fortified bastions protected the new royal city. It later became the military starting point for the Moors' conquest of Andalusia in southern Spain. The death of Yaqub el Mansur marked the end of the city's golden years. Subsequent rulers chose to reside in Marrakesh. However, at the beginning of the 17th century, Jews and Muslims from the lost empire of Al-Andalus returned to the abandoned city of Rabat. On the opposite banks of the Bure Greg, in the maze of alleys of Rabat's sister city of Saleh, lived ruthless pirates. For several centuries, they spread fear and terror along the Moroccan coast. Even the reigning Sardians were not safe in Rabat and Saleh. 
1627, the pirates even managed to create an independent republic. The founding of the Kasbah des Udeas dates back to the famous ruler Yaqub el Mansur. From the highest point in the city, the view extends from the Kasbah far across both sea and river towards Saleh. These days, it is mostly the poor who live in Rabat's oldest historical district. Here, the present seems to collide with the past in a highly contrasting and fascinating way. The bustle of slick tradesmen fills the Marché Central, an enclosed market that dates back to the 1920s that is situated at the entrance to the old area of the city. There is an abundance of small shops. The market and nearby lanes attract both locals who come to buy fresh food and tourists who seek out every nook and cranny in search of traditional Moroccan souvenirs. In the centre of Rabat, both old and new buildings combine in an enchanting way. Here, each metre of land is used for development. The area contains a population of half a million. In spite of the city's large volume of traffic, Compared to other major North African cities, Rabat is relatively calm, orderly and peaceful. Intellectual and spiritual life are of great importance in this royal city. With its beautiful minaret, the Friday Mosque, the 18th century Mosque Esuna is the most outstanding religious building in the centre of the city. Morocco's second largest university is located in Rabat as well as several foreign cultural institutions and also the National Museum. It was only at the beginning of the 20th century under Moulay Youssef, who in 1912 signed the Protectorate Treaty with France, that the city became the official residence of Morocco's royal family. Gradually, resistance towards the country's colonial rulers began to increase. Thus, after Sultan Mohammed V returned from exile in 1956, Morocco regained its political independence. But five years later, in 1961, the self-pronounced king passed away. Thus, his son, King Hassan II, took over the seat of power at the Palais Royal. King Hassan II was well known for his ruthlessness towards his political opponents. But he succeeded in winning back the territory of the Western Sahara, 
an area formerly under the control of Spain and rich in valuable natural resources. Beyond the historic town walls in the southern part of the city, and surrounded by the dense vegetation of an ancient park, are the ruins of the Meronides Necropolis of Cella. Since 1269, the Meronides dynasty, who originated from the Beni Merin clan, has taken the place of the Almohades, who previously ruled the country. During their reign, the Meronides built many exceptional monuments. In the course of time, most of the necropolis of Cella has been reclaimed by nature. The final resting place of the sultans was in danger of being lost forever. Nevertheless, several historic buildings have remained visible, such as the ancient ruins of a Roman settlement and the river port of Sala that was inhabited up until the 3rd century. Artistic inscriptions decorate the grave of the most famous Meronide leader, Abu al-Hassan, the Black Sultan, and it's one of the most beautiful sights in this town of the dead. monumental gate decorated with stone reliefs that dates back to the 14th century still marks the entrance to the necropolis that was once surrounded by a mighty clay wall. Little remains of the Abu Yusuf Yaqub Mosque. Covered marabouts, natural growth, storks and herons each add to the magical ambience of the cemetery. The most architecturally impressive of the four royal cities is Meknes. In the 17th century, Mule Ishmael made this city into his own and thus created several new buildings. In addition to the largest gate in the Maghreb, the Bab el Mansur, the city's former 20 kilometer long wall symbolizes a further important legacy and highlights the wealth and flamboyance of the Alawid sovereign. Though Meknes is one of the younger Moroccan royal cities, it contains more than a thousand years of history. Its fertile land was even much prized by the Romans. However, the city owes its name to a tribe of Berbers, the Meknasa, who, due to the region's fertile soil, settled along the shores of the Ued Bufakrani and founded the first village around the beginning of the 10th century. Mm -hmm. 
Meknes reached its zenith after the takeover of the city by its new leader, Mule Ismail. The remains of the immense silos of Heri Esuani and Dar el Ma indicate the proportions of these gigantic constructions. In contrast with most North African cities, the Medina's ground plan is in some areas extremely geometrical and rectangular, almost checkered. It's the lively historic center of the royal city. Like most of Morocco's other large cities, Meknes consists of two contrasting districts, the Old Town and the Ville Nouvelle, built in 1912. The former Berber's village has gradually grown into a large city with more than 500,000 inhabitants. Various handcrafts lie at the heart of its economic growth. In lively market streets such as the Rue Scacchini and the neighboring souks, there are numerous handcrafts in a colorful collection of studios and workshops. Silvercraft is one of the country's many specialities. Today, however, this demanding art is gradually declining, but in the shopping districts of Meknes, the tradition lives on. In the center of Medina, one of the city's most important buildings is the Medusa Bu Inanya. This former Quran school is one of the most beautiful theological universities in Morocco. The two Merinid sultans, Abu El Hassan and Abu Inan, spent a fortune on the extravagant construction of the Madassa. lavish abundance of its decorative elements is simply overwhelming. Artistic majolica and stucco work, mosaics and inscriptions, each ornately decorated. It's very apparent that Moulay Ishmael, the great Alawite sovereign and the city's most influential designer, was extremely enthusiastic about the architecture of the Quran school that dates back to the 14th century. In Meknes, buildings such as the Medursa Buinanya, that dates back to the time of the early Merinid sovereigns, are few and far between. The 
The city is still dominated by the historic buildings created by Moulay Ishmael. For the realization of his plans, building materials were transported from the country's largest and most famous Roman ruins of Volubilis. The Sultan's megalomania was truly historic. For more than 55 years he ruled over his country with grim determination and with a well-organized, powerful and feared army that according to legend was made up of approximately 150,000 blacks who originated from south of the Sahara. It was Moulay Ishmael's desire to transform Meknes into an exquisite royal city, a Moroccan Versailles, and one that reflected his eminently respected role model, the King of France, Louis XIV, the Sun King. The huge royal household of Moulay Ishmael was and still is legendary. Under his reign, a total of 30 palaces were built south of the Medina. He possessed around 30,000 slaves, 12,000 horses and 500 women resided within his harem. The Sultan's mausoleum is one of Morocco's most important and historic funeral mosques. Apart from the years when the country was a French protectorate, the Alawites dynasty that began in the 17th century still exists today. One of the city's most famous locations, the Place El Hadim, represents the transition between the Ville Imperiale of Moulay Ishmael and the more lively area of the souks in the Medina. This is where the normal everyday life of Meknes takes place. The rectangular main square is full of those who make for the souks district to do their daily shopping. The simple design of the lanes helps those new to the city to find their way around with ease. Historic buildings can often be seen while walking through the markets and shopping areas. inspiring city gate of Bab el Mansur is the splendid entrance to the colorful and lively trade and craft district. After the death of Moulay Ishmael in 1727, his son Moulay Abdallah completed the gate's construction. Construction continued for five years, after which the three-arched gate was finally inaugurated. However, Meknes was by then a less influential city.
Nevertheless, the soul of Moulay Ismail lives on in his buildings. Often referred to as Morocco's Sun King, the Sultan's dream of his very own Versailles never reached fruition. Fess, the oldest and at the same time the liveliest of all four royal cities. Beyond its historic walls lies the origin of the Moroccan monarchy, as well as numerous outstanding treasuries of the Islamic Middle Ages. Although the richly decorated three-arch gate of Bab Boujaloud was built in 1913, architecturally it was designed according to Moorish tradition. Ancient traditions have been retained by the city's craftsmen and have been passed on to subsequent generations. Thus, the craftsmanship of bygone times has gradually been honed to a fine art. Some of the city's inhabitants still use donkeys to carry heavy loads. Over the centuries, ancient Fes, Fes El Bali, has remained almost unchanged. In its lanes, time seems to have stood still. The splendid museum, the Musée d'Abata, provides an impressive insight into the city's history and the development of the people's artistic skills. It features traditional Moroccan design. In addition, the Aloitistic Palace, built at the end of the 19th century, contains the country's most complete collection of commercial art. Up until it became a French protectorate in 1912, Fès was the most powerful economic power in North Morocco. Thus, it attracted those from the surrounding area. The range of food products in the Medina is quite remarkable and covers everything from delicious Moroccan favourites to exotic specialities from abroad. Its roads and lanes are full of lively hustle and bustle. Various traders, shoppers and tourists cram themselves into the fascinating though narrow confines of the old town. Here, skilled craftsmen can be seen at work in several studios. The decline of these traditional skills in other regions of Morocco has not so far affected Fes. Chuara, the Tanners district, is one of the most famous and colourful, but at the same time, smelliest districts in the city. The methods applied to the animal furs are several centuries old.
Following these traditional methods, the animal furs are first depilated in large stone tubs, tanned and recolored. Despite the denial of the tanners, today modern chemicals have been integrated into what was formerly a fully natural process. This is not surprising as the work is arduous and the pungent smell that is caused by the production process is extremely unpleasant. Depending upon the direction of the wind, various adjacent roof terraces provide beautiful views of the tanners of Fess. Work at the walled troughs is one of the most unpopular jobs in the souk. The local people protect themselves from the foul-smelling air of the tanneries by carrying small bunches of mint held in front of their nose. Metal engravers and blacksmiths are treated with far more respect. Their unique technical and artistic talents are well known far and wide. They create true masterpieces in their workshops that, however, command a good price. Most of the shops in the old town of Fes El Bali offer artistic copper and brassware for sale, for which the demand is high. It's easy to get lost in the busy and densely crowded lanes. Fes El Jadid, an earlier section of the old town center, is dominated by an immense palace, the Palais Royal. Beyond its gilded bronze gates is a small, luxurious world. Numerous architectural gems highlight the former incredible wealth of Fes. In 798, Moulay Idris I, the great-grandson of the prophetess Fatima, founded the city. However, it was his son, Moulay Idris II, who made the Berber city the capital of his empire. Later, many educated Arabs from the Tunisian town of Kerouan and craftsmen from Cordoba settled down here and brought new prosperity to the city. The relatively new religion of Islam became increasingly important for the inhabitants of Fes. In 859, a pious benefactor from Kerouan ordered the construction of a small prayer hall in Fes. The building eventually became the legendary Karaouin Mosque, one of the most beautiful churches in Morocco. 
Indeed, the nearby university is considered to be one of the most important Islamic theological universities in the Western Hemisphere. The artistically decorated Medusa et Atarin was once a famous seat of learning. However, in the course of time, this boarding school, as with the Medusa Buinanya built in the 14th century under the rule of Sultan Abu Said, was eventually closed down. The Medusa in the Souk Atarin is one of the most beautiful Meronides buildings in the world. Entering the inner courtyard is an unforgettable experience. Between the 13th and 14th centuries, Fes became the residential city of the Meronide Sultans and thus reached its cultural zenith. Even today, several buildings still display the splendor of former days. Fes has always been an innovative city. In 1913, the design of the town gate of Bab Bujalud that dates back to the 13th century was renewed and embellished. Little remains of the former Meronid residence, the center of today's royal palace. Walls protect the interior of the Dar el Magzan from curious onlookers. The monumental gilded bronze gate of the spacious Palais Royal was built between 1969 and 1971. For several centuries, the city of Fes was the focal point of the entire empire, until the involuntary signing of the French Protectorate Treaty. In 1912, the new colonial sovereigns transferred the political and economic center of power to Rabat and Casablanca. Marrakesh's history began in the 11th century, when the Berber tribe of the Almoravides first settled on the Haouz plain. Today, an almost nine meter high bright red wall protects the fairy tale like Medina of Marrakesh, a city with 750,000 inhabitants. Following the brutal destruction of the Almoravid by Abd el Muman, the founder of the Almohad dynasty, Marrakesh soon flourished and became increasingly important after 1147. Along the massive 13 kilometer town wall constructed of clay, 200 bastions were built to protect the resident caliphs and the local population of the Medina from hostile attack.
In the course of time, the early busy caravan trade with Black Africa and Marrakesh's southerly location transformed the city into what was the most African of Morocco's four royal cities. Although the legendary caravans have since been replaced by modern roads and motor vehicles, both past and present continue to live side by side. The city walls are in close proximity to numerous olive plantations and to the extensive and fertile Haouz Plain, as reflected by the various products of the local food traders in the souks. The exotic atmosphere within the shops, the overwhelming variety of delicious products and the amazing aroma of oriental spices fills the picturesque lanes of the old town. The districts within the spacious Medina follow age-old traditions and are subdivided into various specialities. In Marrakesh, brass, copper and silversmiths offer a vast array of products. The attention to detail and exquisite decoration of brass plates and many other impressive treasures serve to highlight the impressive development of Moroccan craftsmanship. The country's export of traditional and highly artistic products has flourished for many years. Moroccan leather goods have become famous all over the world. Goods of the finest quality are to be found in the Arts and Crafts Center in Marrakesh. Beautiful hand-woven carpets are among the most popular export products. The artistry of the weavers in the carpet souk is openly displayed and undertaken with great pride. From the 12th century, when the city's cultural life was at its peak under the power of the mighty Almohades, the narrow, mysterious lanes of the souks have been the vital arteries of the Medina. But the enormous empire of the Almohades that once included Andalusia and the southern regions of Spain was only able to survive up to the beginning of the 13th century. After its decisive military defeat under the armies of the Spanish King Alfonso VIII, the empire soon began to crumble. But even prior to the setback, Marrakesh had already lost much of its political influence. Sultan Yaqub El Mansur preferred to live in Rabat, and a few decades later the country fell under the control of the Merenides.
The center of the old town contains a unique architectural treasure, the Medersa Ben Yusef, known as one of the most amazing legacies of the Merinidis dynasty. The Medersa was the largest Quran school in the entire Maghreb. However, this religious institution has since closed down and is now bereft of students. But the striking building still exists to the present day. The Merinide Sultan Abu El Hassan founded the Medersa in the middle of the 14th century. In 1564, the building was renovated and enlarged by the Saadian Moulay Abdallah. And its construction and embellishment continued right up until the 18th century. The Moorish fascination and passion for ornamentation is more than evident. The former caravan stop and parade ground of Jama El Fna is one of the most original and ethnic open-air vaudeville shows in Africa. With its countless jugglers, snake charmers and general entertainers, Jama El Fna is like something from 1001 Nights. Mesmerized by the oriental atmosphere, an assortment of performers attract thousands of spectators each day, consisting of both locals and foreign visitors. The control of the Sardians was to last only 100 years. From 1667, the country was reigned by another Arabic family of sultans, the Alawites, who were thought to be directly related to the Prophet Muhammad. An undisputed landmark of Marrakesh is the 77-meter-high minaret of the Qutubia Mosque that has towered above the city for hundreds of years an outstanding monument of the Almohad. The sandstone minaret was the architectural model of further famous buildings of the dynasty, the Giralda in Seville and the Hassan Tower in Rabat. In 1158, Abd el Mumen began the construction of the mosque, but it was not until the rule of his grandson, Yaqub el Mansur, at the end of the 12th century, that the church was completed. The former palace of the Almoravids was located only a few meters from the Kutubua. However, today there is nothing to be seen of the former royal residence. Due to its visual appeal, the minaret is a fine example of the sacred buildings of the Maghreb. The Manara Gardens of today owe their design to a sultan of the 19th century, Sidi Mohammed. The pavilion located on the 1870 Al Mahadic Reservoir is particularly striking amid the surrounding fruit and olive plantations. It 
Mansion's exterior is of classical and decorative Moorish elegance. Everywhere, highly detailed stucco and exquisite ornamentation decorate this architectural gem. There's a wonderful view from the pavilion's terrace that includes the nearby lush vegetation of the olive plantations that were planted by the Almohads and cover an area of around 88 hectares. Even today, each of the four royal cities displays the former enormity, power and beauty of Maghreb culture in Morocco. Thus, these historical monuments still manage to reflect the splendor of the country's intriguing and glorious past.